phase transitions, Ashkin Teller models, percolation, graph theory, derivation of E is equal to MC square using the Lorentz group, fluid dynamics and comments on the Navier-Stokes equation in three dimensions, quantum chaos, compressed sensing, so on. And of course, a host of other mathematical topics. So in this book, uh, Darren Stav invites us to a tour of the great, complex, beautiful, but very difficult landscape of mathematics and its diverse role in comprehending the world around us. It is for this reason I felt that it looked very fantastic to have Terry Tao give a public lecture in this institute and take us on another grand tour. With these few words, I'd like to invite uh, Professor M.S. Raghunathan to say a few words and present a memento to Terry Tao and also a bouquet of flowers. Thank you, Smita. <clears throat> this public lecture is also part of the Abel Symposium, which uh, the Abel Committee has been traditionally organizing in places outside Oslo, <clears throat> whenever they meet. And I'm very happy that uh, Terence Tao has agreed to give this public lecture on this occasion. And I'm happy to see that uh, not just mathematicians, many mem not just uh, physicists and Many other members of the public have come here to hear him out. He is, of course, an outstanding mathematician of our times. And uh, Professor Deependra Prasad will say more about him. But let me, at this point, welcome him here and present him on behalf of the So I won't take any more of your time. Let me ask Professor Prasad to. <coughs> Welcome you all to this public lecture. Uh, I am requested to say a few words about the speaker today. Perhaps one could go on and on and talk about uh, so much besides mathematics uh, research that he has uh, been writing on his uh, web page, on his blogs. Uh, I guess uh, among the young, younger generation, he is uh, also a very well-known name. So what I would maybe say would be perhaps uh, well known to all of you, but in any case, uh, I have to do this pleasant duty. I will do this. Uh, 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 in fact, uh, in the morning, somebody asked me, who is Terence Tao? And I said, uh, just look for the youngest person in, the, in that gathering. And uh, so indeed, uh, Terence Tao is still a very young mathematician who has accomplished uh, more than anybody else that uh, I know about ever. Uh, he was born in 1975 in Australia and already from his uh, early childhood uh, uh, showed uh, exceptional mathematical abilities. Uh, he uh, competed in the Mathematics Olympiad at age 10, 11, and 12. And uh, first time he got the bronze, second time the silver, and at age 12 he got the gold. And then of course he decided uh, 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 to not compete any further in such a program. <laughs> I guess he had uh, proved himself. Uh, 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 he, in each of these uh, age groups, uh, 10, 11, 12, he won uh, bronze, silver, and gold. He was the youngest, and perhaps he remains the youngest uh, in these uh, uh, programs, Olympiad programs. Uh, uh, later on, he uh, was a graduate student in Princeton in his teens, and uh, I don't have the age when he completed his PhD, but in any case, uh, 
he became a professor at UCLA, a, a full professor at UCLA at age 24. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, Tow has uh, published more than 200 research papers, uh, has many, many books, and is already one of the most cited mathematicians. Uh, uh, he has solved an impressive uh, number of very important and deep problems in mathematics. And uh, uh, these exceptional problem-solving abilities have also enabled him to discover many new and fruitful connections to uh, many fundamental uh, problems and areas of uh, current research. Uh, one of the easier to understand theorems is about uh, arithmetic progressions in primes, which perhaps we are going to hear today. Uh, uh, something about uh, his uh, various uh, awards and accolades. Uh, I already mentioned about the Olympiad program that uh, he competed uh, at the age 10 and then uh, it has been going on and uh, on. I mean, uh, just uh, maybe a few weeks back, he was awarded the Crawford Prize with uh, Bourguignon at uh, Princeton. And in between, he got the Fields Medal a few years ago. In fact, the... <laughs> Uh, list, uh, the list of uh, uh, his uh, awards is perhaps pretty large and there is perhaps no reason to list them all. So with these words, maybe I just invite uh, Terry Tao to give the public lecture. Well, thank you very much for the, the very kind introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be back here in India. This is my, my second time here. I was here in 2008, uh, not here in Mumbai, actually, in, in Chennai. Um, but it's great to see the uh, great to experience uh, Indian hospitality and uh, authentic Indian food again. Uh, I actually have a slight connection to India, actually. My uh, mother's mother's father was from India. So I'm one, one eighth Indian, actually. So <laughs> it makes me a person of Indian origin or something. But um, anyway, it's, it's, it's great to be back here. Um, so, um, yeah, so uh, I am indeed going to give a, a tour um, of, uh, of a little, uh, um, of uh, one little field of mathematics, uh, prime number theory, uh, one of the oldest uh, um, fields of mathematics, uh, but still a very active one, and actually one in which, uh, in which there have been many Indian mathematicians actually making uh, great contributions. Um, this is a public lecture, so I won't be able to uh, to give, go into details, and there's, there's no way I can really describe what's been going on in, in 2,000 years in, in one hour. Um, so this is a very quick tour. It's like uh, going to India and only seeing the Taj Mahal and saying, I've, I've seen India. Um, it's not really a, a representative, but maybe it'll give you a little taste of, uh, of, uh, of things. So um, it's, uh, and it's one of my favorite uh, theories of mathematics, uh, prime number theory. So uh, just to remind you, what a prime number is, uh, a prime number is any number greater than one, uh, which can't be factored into two smaller numbers. So two, three, five, seven. So, um, yeah, so over here we have the first few prime numbers, and they just go on and on and on and on. Uh, here's the biggest one that we know of so far, uh, explicitly, but, but uh, it just keeps going on after that. Um, so th these are the prime numbers. Um, so they've been studied uh, ever since, basically, um, um, mathematics became formalized. So um, at least since the ancient Greeks, and I think even before then, uh, the, the prime numbers were, were known. Um, but the, the, the Greeks uh, did prove two, the, the first two fundamental theorems about the prime numbers, um, which, make them, which is uh, what makes them so important, actually. Um, so the first is the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, that every natural number uh, greater than one can be written as the product of primes. You can break up, so not every number is prime, but you can always break up a number as the product of primes in basically just one way, uh, other than rearrangement. So like um, the number 30 is 2 times 3 times 5. You can rearrange it as 2 times 5 times 3 and, and so forth. But other than rearranging, there's basically only one way to split up a number into primes. 
So that's the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, uh, and that first appears in print in the famous uh, book of Euclid. Um, and the other uh, basic theorem that the Greeks proved was Euclid's theorem, that there are, the primes just go on and on and on. There are infinitely many primes, that uh, you can never run out of prime numbers. So these are the first basic facts about the prime numbers. So the fundamental theorem um, tells us that the prime numbers play a very important role in number theory, that they're basically like the, at the atomic elements the, uh, of, of, of the integers. So in chemistry, we know that every molecule is made up of atoms, and hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, and so forth. And similarly, every um, natural number or every integer is made up of primes. Um, so we have a couple of numbers here, and they can split up into primes. By the way, it's because of this theorem um, that we don't consider one to be a prime number anymore. Uh, we used to until about 100 years ago, uh, 200 years ago now. Because, um, of course, one also can't be factored into smaller factors. But if you make one a prime, then uh, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic doesn't work anymore because now you can factor a number of primes in, in many different ways. Like 10 can be 2 times 5, or 2 times 5 times 1, 2 times 5 times 1 times 1. And we really do like the fundamental theorem of uh, arithmetic. So we, uh, we, we dropped one as a prime about 150 years ago. Um, OK, so one is no longer prime. Um, so that's the fundamental the theorem of arithmetic. So the other thing was Euclid's theorem. That was, there's infinitely many primes. Um, and it's a, it, it, it has a very short proof. You, uh, you can learn it in high school. Um, and um, well, there's several ways to, 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 uh, to formulate the proof. But, but my favorite way of stating it is uh, as, a, as a proof by contradiction, that uh, you um, uh, you show that there's finitely, infinitely many primes by showing that there's not finitely many primes. And I, want, I want to show you the proof. Probably many of you have seen it already. But uh, it's, it's, it's a beautiful little argument. Um, so if you want to prove that there's infinitely many primes, then su suppose not. Suppose that there are actually only finitely many primes in the world, that there's, there's a, a finite number of primes, let's say 2, 3, and 5, and then, there's, and then it stops. There's no more, more primes after a certain point. So if you have only finitely many primes, you can modify them all together. And so you can, you can, if the only primes in the world are 2, 3, and 5, you can multiply them together, you get 30. And then you add 1 to it, this number, and you get another number. Let's call that capital P. So you, take, uh, uh, so you can take all the primes in the world, multiply them together, if there's only finitely many, and add 1, and you get a new number, 31 in this case. Um, and the way, because of the way we constructed this number, this is a number which is bigger than 1, but is not divisible by any prime, just because it has a remainder 1 when you divide it by any, any of the primes. And we have put all the primes together. But this can't happen, because this contradicts the um, fundamental theorem of arithmetic, okay, the first theorem that we said, so that every number must be able to be split into primes. And here's a number that can't be. And that's a contradiction. And so that tells you that there's infinitely many primes. Um, so that's a great little argument. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful example of proof by contradiction. Um, there's a quote which I like by uh, the British mathematician G. H. Hardy, um, which says that uh, reductio ad absurdum, which is Latin for proof by contradiction, which Euclid loved so much, is one of a mathematician's finest weapons. It is a finer gambit than any chess gambit. A chess player may offer the sacrifice of a pawn or even a piece, but a mathematician offers the entire game <laughs> and still wins. So, so that is, uh, um, that is uh, the uh, Euclid's theorem. So uh, we, we have the fundamental theorem. It tells us that every number can, at least in principle, be factored into primes. But um, the theorem doesn't tell us how to factor a number into primes, well, other than by sort of very painfully just checking uh, um, all the factors one by one. Um, and actually, um, if you take a very big number, like a number with, say, 200 digits, um, the fundamental theorem tells us uh, yeah, this number can be factored into primes, but it doesn't tell us how. And in fact, nobody knows, uh, at least no one we know of, uh, knows how to factor primes, uh, these, these, these large numbers, very, very rapidly. Um, and that's actually, uh, and it's actually very important that nobody knows, because um, there are many key cryptographic algorithms that are used nowadays, such as the RSA algorithm, which it's used routinely now uh, in bank transactions and the internet and so forth, which are only secure because um, the, that uh, because very large numbers 
um, are unable to be factored into, 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 into prime factors, as, at least as far as we know. Um, yeah, ironically, I prepared these slides before um, finding out a few weeks ago that people had discovered uh, some weaknesses in RSA, but not because of factoring, because of a, a different problem in random number generation. That's a, a separate issue. Um, um, anyway, so, um, um, so actually, it's one of the few cases where um, the absence of knowledge is actually a, a very valuable fact. OK. Um, in a, in a similar fashion, Euclid's theorem tells us, again, in principle, that there's infinitely many primes out there. Um, so you know, eventually, you will find the millionth prime and the trillionth prime and, and so forth. But again, it doesn't tell us how to find them quickly. Um, I mean, you could just very slowly search through um, the, the, the numbers one at a time. But there's no quick recipe to, uh, to find large primes. Um, I should mention, though, that uh, actually since I'm in India, I mean, there, there is this, this very lovely result uh, about 10 years ago of uh, Agarwal, KL, and Saxena, um, the Indian mathematicians, that uh, if, I, if, um, if you give me a number, a large number, I can tell whether it's prime or not very, very quickly. They have this, this lovely algorithm, the AKS algorithm. Um, but um, um, so I, any individual number, uh, I can tell whether it's prime or not. But there's just so many numbers out there that it's, it's not easy to, to work out. For example, how many primes there are up to one trillion, or what is what is a trillionth prime? This is these these are questions that we can only answer very slowly. So we, we can't actually find primes that are um, that are. Um, I mean, there are infinitely many primes, but we we don't know where all of them are. Uh, the biggest prime that we actually do know how to write down is uh, is this guy here, two to the forty three million one hundred four thousand six hundred nine minus one. Um, so that's a big number, uh, twelve million digits long. Uh, and it was shown to be prime in 2008 by a huge uh, distributed uh, uh, internet uh, uh, computing um, um, project uh, called GIMPS, the Great Internet Mersenne Prime Survey. Uh, this picture, by the way, uh, on, the, on the background, is, this is supposed to be a picture of the internet. Um, I don't actually know how uh, they found this picture, but how they built this picture. But uh, I think every, every dot is supposed to be a server and so forth. So it's a nice little graph. Um, OK. So the primes go on and on, but we don't know any prime bigger than that one, at least so far. Um, and part of the reason is that the prime numbers um, have this very funny property that, that I mean, they're, they're not random. You don't have to roll any die or flip any coin to make the prime numbers. But they, they, they do seem to exhibit a lot of random properties. And it's, it's very hard to predict where the next prime is, is going to come from. Um, that, um, and we, the, the primes just sort of appear um, to be to be in, in some way to have to be um, free of pattern in some way, and so it, because because of that, it's, it's hard to find out what the primes are doing uh, in, in in many ways. Um, I mean, it's 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 it, in, in contrast with other numbers, like say the square numbers. Okay, so the square numbers, like the prime numbers, is another sequence of numbers: one, four, nine, sixteen, and so forth. But it's very easy to um, to to see what the square numbers are doing. Like if I want to find the, the millionth square number, that's just one million squared. It's very easy. Want to find the millionth prime number? Uh, then that's that's a, that's a much harder question. Um, actually, um, I can maybe just reinforce this point. So um, I, probably everyone here knows of the uh, Indian mathematician Ramanujan, one of the greatest mathematicians uh, ever. Um, and one of his specialties was finding amazing formulas for things that people didn't think had beautiful formulas uh, for. You know, he had these lovely series and and integrals and, and uh, identities. And um, one of the few times he actually made a mistake and wrote down a formula which didn't actually work uh, was when he tried to find a form he tried to compute a formula for the nth prime number, um, and uh, he wrote his letter to Hardy thinking, saying that I think this this might, formula might work, and it turned out that it didn't. That's one of the few times that we know of that actually uh, Ramanujan wrote um, wrote a formula that actually wasn't correct. Um, yeah, the the uh, the, uh, the prime numbers do seem to defy all attempts to sort of uh, pin them down exactly like that. Um, so just to give you one example of um, what we don't know, there's a, there's a lot we don't know about the prime numbers. So one of the oldest conjectures in mathematics, which may even go back to the ancient Greeks, although it's not actually written in any of the, the Greek um, uh, um, texts, um, is, the, is the twin prime conjecture. So we do know that there's infinitely many primes. That's Euclid, Euclid's theorem. But you could, um, you could take the next step and say, um, instead of looking for primes, the, for twins of primes, uh, pairs of, of primes, p and p plus two, which are different, which are both prime, and differ by just a, a, exactly two. 
Um, so uh, over here, we, we have the first few primes, uh, twin primes, three and five, five and seven, 11 and 13. These are, these are twin primes. Um, and there seem to be a lot of twin primes, of course, not as many as, as primes, but they, they still go on and on. Um, but what we don't know is whether, um, we, we know the primes go on forever, but we don't know whether the twin primes go on forever, whether they're infinitely many twin primes. Um, the largest pair of twin primes is actually this, this piece over here, um, which was discovered actually just last year by computer search. Uh, but for all we know, that's the last one. I mean, it's, that's almost certainly not, uh, but uh, you know, it, it, it could possibly um, end there. Um, so that question is still open. Um, so um, regarding the, the randomness of the primes, Paul Erdős, this great Hungarian mathematician, had, had this lovely quote that uh, God may not play dice with the universe, uh, which is a riffing off of a quote of Einstein, actually. Uh, but something strange is going on with the prime numbers. Okay. There's something almost random going on in there, even though the primes are not actually random. So, but we do believe that the primes behave kind of randomly, that they're sort of strewn around um, all over the, the images in, in, in more or less a random way. Uh, and there's various ways to quantify that. And it, I mean, and this is, this is not just sort of an academic mathematical question. It, it, uh, it's actually, it's very important that they behave randomly in certain precise senses um, in order for certain um, algorithms in, in cryptography to actually work. Um, and in particular for certain algorithms in, in what's called public key cryptography, which, which is now used um, everywhere in, in the modern world. So let me just digress a little bit to explain public key uh, cryptography because it's a, it's a lovely little solution to, to a, um, a puzzle which at first glance seems very difficult. Um, so to explain what public key cryptography is, let me give you a physical analogy. So, um, no, so, so suppose um, there are two friends, um, Alice and Bob, and for some, for some reason in cryptography the, the two friends are always called Alice and Bob, I don't know why. Um, and Alice wants to send a box G of something valuable, I don't know, maybe that box there, to, uh, to a friend Bob. But Bob, Bob lives um, in, a, in a very distant, uh, distant place. So maybe Alice is in India and Bob is, is in America or something. Okay, so she has this box and she wants, and let's call it G, uh, G for generator, but that, that will come later, um, to her friend Bob. Okay, but she's worried that if she sends this box in the mail that, that someone at the post office is going to open it and take out what's inside it. Okay, so of course that never happens in India. Um, but anyway, so now she could lock the box. I put a lock on it. Um, but, then, um, but then if she sends it over to, uh, to Bob, then Bob just gets a locked box. Um, and let, let's assume that the box is unbreakable or too valuable to break, so Bob can't, can't, uh, can't, can't smash open the box. So of course she has to also send over the key. But if she sends the key, then maybe the key might also be, 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 uh, be intercepted. And then um, whoever's at the post might take the box and the key. And then, and then, um, um, uh, and then again, you could, you could take what's in the box. So the question is, uh, how could you send the, uh, the, um, the box over to Bob um, and make it so that Bob could, could, could open the box, but no one, no one in the middle could, could open the box? So it's a tricky problem, but um, you can solve it. Um, and there's many solutions, actually. Um, but here's, here's one solution which is quite cute. It's what's called a three-pass protocol. So what Alice does is that she takes the box G, okay, and she locks it. She, she puts a padlock A on the box, uh, and now she has a box with a lock on it, and we'll call the lock box a G to the A. Um, and then she keeps the key. The, uh, she, she keeps her, her, her key to, to, to the lock, and then she just sends the lock box over to, to Bob. So now Bob has a locked box. Now, Bob can't open this box because he doesn't have the key. So what he does is that, well, he brings out his own lock and he puts another lock on the box. And now the box has two locks on it. Uh, so the, he has his own padlock called B. And then uh, now we have a, a doubly locked box, which is called G to the AB. And she has two, um, uh, uh, two locks on this box. And then he sends the doubly locked box back to Alice. Okay? So now Alice has a, has a box of two locks on it. Now, uh, and she, you know, she can't do anything about Bob's lock. Uh, she just has Bob's key. But she has her own key. And so she can unlock her key now from, um, from the box. Okay? And leaving only the, uh, Bob's key, so the, the box due to the B. 
And then she sends back the box back to Bob, and now Bob uses his key, and now he can unlock the box. Okay. So this is a free pass protocol. It's very clever. Um, I hear that actually the uh, US Defense Department actually uses this protocol for certain physical documents. So I'm so I'm told. Okay, but um, <laughs> so lots of going back and forth in, with locked lock briefcases and so forth. But anyway, um, okay. But this so this is so this is a cute little um, uh, strategy. But the great thing about about this, this strategy is that it, it works perfectly well not just for physical valuables but for digital data like numbers. Um, if you are willing to use prime numbers. So you can do exactly the same. Oops. Oh, I can actually before I sorry before I, I go there. So as I said, this this um, uh, this protocol is uh, is secure in the sense that if if you have an eavesdropper, which is always called Eve in cryptography, um, and the you know the eavesdropper will see various lock lock boxes going by, usually A, usually A B, usually B, but but she will never see an unlocked box. And so. Um, Okay, so then it, you can believe then that, she, that there's no way for her to actually uh, recover the actual box itself from just by seeing um, the, the three lock boxes. So you can actually use exactly the same method um, digitally to send uh, numbers, uh, such as a credit card number or a PIN number or something very, some other s uh, valuable number from, uh, say, over the internet, uh, e even in a public system where, where everyone can see all, all the bits that are going back and forth. Um, and you can actually just copy that method ex exactly, um, uh, modulo or prime, and that gives you what's called the Massey Omura crypto system. And it works, it works the same way. So that um, Alice has some secret number G, um, like a, uh, a credit card number or something that she wants to send over. So um, the way she does it, um, and she wants to send it to Bob. And the way she does it is, um, well, the very first thing they need to do is they need, they need to pick um, a large prime P. And, uh, it's, uh, we'll see where the prime P comes in later. Uh, so you have to pick a large one. Uh, you can pick one of the, the large ones I mentioned before. Actually, those ones are not so good, but you, 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 uh, you, actually, you should actually pick a random prime. Uh, it's much better than, a, than actually a special prime. But um, you, you choose a random prime. And then Alice takes this number G, the secret number, and she locks it in a certain sense by t picking another secret number A, her own special um, um, uh, secret number. Um, and she raises g to the power a, and she gets a very big number. But then to mix that number up a little bit, uh, you divide it by p, and you take the remainder mod p. And that gives you some other number. That's, a, that's sort of a scrambled version of, of g to the a. And that's, that's a, um, the reason you take um, uh, residues mod p is because um, then it's much harder to work out what g is from g to the a. If, if, you, if she actually sent g to the a without um, uh, taking the remainder, then you could take logarithms, and you could start figuring out. Um, um, the original um, G, but if you, if you take mod P, then it's much harder. Um, and then so you, uh, you, uh, you lock this number, and then you, you, and then you send the lock number to Bob. Bob has his um, um, lock number, and then he picks his own secret key B, and then he raises G to the A to the power B, takes that remainder mod P. That's a doubly locked number. He sends the doubly locked number back to Alice. Alice then unlocks her, um, her part of, 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 of the... Uh, of the number by taking an eighth root, uh, which you can do mod p by a little bit of number theory. I won't get into it here. But she can, un she can sort of unlock um, her side of the number and then back to a single locked number, which she sends back to Bob, and then Bob can unlock that number and recover uh, g. Oh, yes? How did, how did Bob know to only raise g to the a to the b because he doesn't know what g is? No, but he knows what g to the a is. Uh, so. So he raises G to the A to the B. Yeah, so, so I mean, it's... Um, but he only knew what G to the A mod P was. Ah, yeah, okay, okay, so he raised G to the A mod P to the B. Okay, yeah, so um, it, it's using... A, yeah, so if, if, if you take a number mod P, G to the A mod P, and you raise the power B, it turns out that that's the same as taking G to the A B mod P. Yeah, so, I mean, there, there is some mathematics uh, yeah, that, 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 that needs to be done to actually make this work. Um, you know, I mean, it's 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 not like physically. There's no physical locks. Uh, you have to you have to actually uh, make sure that it all works. Okay. Um, yeah, but this is the, but uh, this is the Massimo Mura uh, crypto system. Um, it's actually used in, in practice, actually, uh, for for uh, for many uh, applications. Um, yeah, and you, you need this large prime p because if you don't have this p, then um, you can take logs 
of G A G B G A B and actually solve for G if you don't have this P. So you, you need the P to sort of mix up um, all the numbers that are being passed back and forth. Um, so uh, it's widely believed. Um, well, you're not, well, it's not universally believed, but it's, it's widely believed that, uh, although, although not, uh, not actually proven, um, that this algorithm is actually secure against eavesdropping. That, that if, you are, if, if an eavesdropper sees these three random numbers coming back and forth, um, that, uh, that the, there should not be able to be a way to, to, very, to quickly work out what, what, uh, uh, what, what G was uh, from all the data that's going back and forth. Um, that's not actually proven. Uh, it's connected to a very f uh, famous problem that's unsolved. It's called the p equals np problem, uh, or p not equal to np problem, really. Um, that um, okay. Well, if p was equal to np, then then you, you, in principle, you should be able to crack this 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 code as well as any other public key cryptography protocol, actually. Um, but that that's unsolved. And so it's, it's one of the seven famous Millennium Prize problems, like of the uh, Clay Math Institute. Good. OK, but we do have uh, some partial results that indicate um, uh, that there's, there's, there's some security of this algorithm. Uh, one that I'm, I'm quite fond of, actually, is, is by a friend of mine, Jean Bogan, just like you mentioned earlier. Um, so uh, what he showed is that, is that um, if, if you pick all your data randomly, so if, if, if Alice is sending a random number and she locks it with another random number and Bob locks his number with another random number, then you, um, um, the eShopper gets these three numbers going back and forth. Um, and uh, what, what Jean showed a few years ago was that uh, the numbers that, that are coming back and forth um, are what's called uniformly distributed, which basically means, roughly speaking, means that the, um, if you just look at the most significant digits of each of the three numbers that, that the eShopper will see, so you, you, you forget about the, the smallest digits, you just look at the biggest digits, those digits look like a random string of numbers, just random noise. And there's no way that you can take a random string of noise and, dec and, and decode anything other, other than more random, no uh, random noise. So um, what this shows is, is that if an eShopper only, could only see the, the, um, the most significant digits of, of each number that's passed back and forth, then she, um, she couldn't crack the code. Um, now, this doesn't mean that the, the, whole, the whole thing is secure, because of course, the eShopper might also get to see the least significant digits, and that you, you could use maybe to crack the code. So this is, this is not definitive proof of anything. Um, so Jean didn't get a million dollars for that. He got a heap of something else, actually, but that's uh, another good story. Um, OK, but that's, uh, okay, but it's, some, it's some evidence to, that shows that the algorithm is secure. OK. Um, so, um, all right, so I mean, this, and so Jean's result is, sort of, is, is some evidence that the, 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 the primes have some sort, of, sort of randomness to them. Um, and as I said, the, the primes behave so randomly that we don't really, you know, we have no good way to find out exactly what the nth prime is, right? We've, we've, we've tried very hard to find an exact formula for the nth prime. And basically, the best formula we have is p sub n. Right? The nth p, p, p prime is just the p-th prime. That, that's all we can say. Um, but, um, well, that's all we're interested in an in, 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 um, exact formula. But there's a, a very important approximate formula, which is, which is very powerful. Um, and it's called the prime number theorem. And it's possibly the, the most important theorem in number theory. Um, and it says that uh, if you want to, to know what the nth prime is, I can't tell you exactly where it is, but I can tell you approximately where it is. It's, it's approximately n times the natural logarithm of n. And the, the nth prime known for large n, it will be close to, to n log n. Um, over here, we have a little graph. I think the, uh, the dotted line is, 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 the, um, uh, is the nth prime number. It's a function of n. And then the solid line thing is n log n. So there's a slight gap, but, but they're fairly close approximations. Is it very close to early approximation? N and N minus N equals N to the um, the, um, That one, no. The Sterling approximation is connected to the primes in a different way, but uh, not. But the three lines, uh, only two are clear now. Uh, yeah, there'll be a third line coming in just a little bit. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll explain the third line in, 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 in a minute. Yeah. Um, Let's see, is there a direct connection to the Stirling's approximation? Um, it's, uh, there are connections. The Stirling's approximation is connected to something called the gamma function, which is connected to something called the zeta function, which is connected to the primes, um, but not quite in this way. It's in a slightly, slightly roundabout, uh, in a slightly different way. Um, okay. So um, here we have. <laughs> 
here we have a, a mathematician working on, on, uh, on the, the, the Riemann hypothesis. Um, so th there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a more precise formula, which is more complicated than n log n, uh, which, um, which, which should give a more accurate formula for the nth, for the nth prime. Um, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll write it, actually. That if, if you want the, uh, okay, so the, 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 the nth prime should roughly um, oops, be the solution to this, this funny integral equation here. Um, so it's more complicated than n log n. Um, so there's, there's a more precise formula for the, uh, the nth prime, or most, uh, which, um, which is actually the other line. So this is third line, which is the, this dashed line, which is very, very close to the dotted line. And that's, that, that, that's, that's, the, um, uh, that's the, the line which is predicted by this formula. It's, it's still not exactly accurate, but it is very close. Like, you know, if you want to find, say, the, uh, the trillionth prime of this formula, that's accurate by six decimal places. Um, and the fact, so we believe, so this is this more accurate formula, which is, uh, which we believe in fact to be, to be extremely accurate in a certain, in a certain uh, precise sense, and, and that sense is known as, as, the, as the Riemann hypothesis, um, and that's that's another one of these these famous uh, uh, million dollar problems actually from the. Uh, the um, so, um, okay, so. The prime number theorem is uh, was was uh, is uh, as, as I said was one of the landmark achievements of, of, of number theory. I mean, it was conjectured long ago by Gauss. Gauss actually like wrote down by hand the first like ten thousand primes or something and conjectured the prime number theorem out of it. Um, but it was only proven uh, about hundred years ago. Um, it's got it has an amazing proof. Um, so I showed you the proof of uh, Euclid's theorem. That's a proof from two thousand years ago. So I, let me show you a more modern proof, a proof that uh, is only hundred years old. Um, and uh, uses much more sophisticated techniques. So, it, uh, the, the prime number theorem is proven, roughly speaking, as follows. So, um, the first thing you need to do is you need to encode the primes um, as as a function. Or, or as I wrote like, so, imagine like a, a, um, a sound wave which was silent um, except at times of your prime. So, at time one, there's nothing. At time two, there's a sound. Times three, sound four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, so forth. Okay, um, and so this, you 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 create you create a sort of a sound wave that that um, uh, that goes on like this, um, and then you, t you take this this wave and you sort of listen to it, um, and the, by listen to it by t uh, taking a, a transform, like a Fourier transform. Actually, Fourier transform is not quite the right thing to do. You take a Mellon transform, which is a close cousin of the Fourier transform. So you 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 uh, listen down as it goes on, and you start picking up um, um, And so the, the, there's there are these slow oscillations in the primes, which uh, correspond to, to various notes, which you can hear once you can or see once you once you take this transform. Um, and um, this pattern of notes uh, it's, it's sometimes called the music of the primes, although the the, the more precise name is, is the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. Um, <laughs> music of the primes is, is, is more poetic. Although you can go on the internet, you can look for music of the primes, and, and you'll find these sound files where you can actually listen to, to the primes. It doesn't actually look very, sound very musical, actually. It's just a, um, but um, anyway, you you, um, you you have these various notes which correspond to, to these various oscillations in the primes. Now there are certain notes which, uh, because of their positioning, are sort of loud in a certain sense, which would create really huge oscillations in. The, uh, the distribution of prime numbers so large that the prime number theorem will not actually work anymore. That would be false. And what you have to show is that these certain loud notes don't actually appear. In, um, that when you take the Fourier transform or Mellon transform of the primes, you don't get certain um, um, uh, certain zeros in certain locations. And this is the hard part um, of, of the proof. But once once you know that certain notes are, are not there, that most of that uh, somehow it's a um, uh, the notes are are um, are somehow very harmonious, then uh, you can you can convert that back into information about the primes themselves by various mathematical tools such as Fourier analysis or contour integration, and you can get back the prime number theorem from there. Okay, so uh, you have to use more sophisticated mathematics than what Euclid had, but uh, this this is how the proof works. Um, okay, so the um, the prime number theorem shows that the primes do have some structure to them. Not, I mean, they're not completely random in the sense that we have some uh, predictability to them, that we, we know approximately 
how many primes there are up to uh, in, in any given uh, region. We know roughly where the nth prime is and so forth. Uh, so sort of la at the macroscopic scale, at large scales, we know what the primes look like. Uh, but at small scales, uh, uh, they are quite random. So um, to illustrate this, th th this is a picture of the first, uh, of all the prime numbers up, up to 20,000. So uh, the way this works is that every dot, white or black, is, 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 a, is a number. And the black dots are, are primes, and the white dots are non-primes. So I don't know if you can see it, but the, the, at the very top left corner, there is a, a white dot. That's number one. And then there are these two black dots side by side. That's two and three. Um, and then there's a white dot, which is four, five, six, seven, and so forth. And then it just keeps going. Um, so you, you have these black dots. Um, they start out sort of dense, and then they get slowly sparser and sparser as, um, as, as, as you keep going to, to bigger and bigger numbers. That corresponds to this n log n. It's this log n factor is making this, um, the primes get sparser more and more spread out. Now, if, if you look at this, this picture, on, on the one hand, there's, there's some structure to it. Like you can start to see, you know, there's, there's lots of, um, of vertical lines which are completely free of primes. And that corresponds to the fact that every even number is not a prime other than two. And there's some other, um, and then every so often you get a multiple of six, and I think that's a, the, the, that corresponds to, to these uh, big, uh, so uh, these, these wider bands. Um, no, yeah, sorry, if, if a number, um, any number which is remained of two, three, or four mod six is not prime other than two or three. So that creates these very really thick bands. And I think uh, that's these, these diagonal lines are multiples of five and so on. So th there, are, there are some patterns you can see. In, in, in this picture, but on the other hand, you know, after a while, you, you just get these sort of random-looking dots. So this, 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 uh, it's sort of a mix of both both a pattern structure and and random structure, um, and it's slowly getting sparser and sparser as as as, as you keep going. Um, so, I mean, the primes do have some patterns to them. Um, so, as I said, all the primes are odd except for for two, of course. Um, all the primes sit next are adjacent to a multiple of six. Uh, plus or minus one, um, with two exceptions, two and three. Uh, if you look at the last digit of a prime, it's always one, three, seven, or nine, with two exceptions again, two and five. So you have all these local patterns, and that corresponds to all these stripes here, of all these prime free regions here. So you've got some local structure, you've got some global structure coming from the prime number theorem and some, rel some relatives of the prime number theorem. And then you've got all this small scale randomness. Um, and it turns out that if you combine all these three ingredients about the primes together, then you can start proving things about the primes. Uh, you can't prove everything you want about the, about the primes, but, but you can prove some stuff. Um, for instance, um, um, one, uh, one, very, one nice application of, of, uh, of uh, once you actually formalize and exploit all these things I've just said, then you can prove what's called Vinogradov's theorem, um, which is the following. Uh, it, um, it's the best result known towards um, a old conjecture of Goldbach. Um, so uh, Goldbach conjectured that every odd number bigger than five should be expressible as a sum of three, uh, three primes, like, a, like a 11 should be what, five plus, uh, plus three plus three. Um, so that, that's not yet known. Um, I mean, in fact, it's one of the few conjectures that actually a, has a popular novel uh, about it, actually. Um, but we have this theorem of Vinogradov that says that as long as your, uh, your number n is big enough, uh, any number that, which is large enough uh, and odd um, can be written as the sum of three primes. So we, we, we have proven Goldbach's conjecture for large enough n. So uh, how large is large? Uh, Vinogradov didn't actually say how large it was. Um, so it turns out that you can actually work out, um, you can squeeze out a, a bound from this proof eventually. Uh, the best bound known is that any number n which is larger than 10 to the 1346 uh, is the sum of three primes, any odd number. Um, on the other hand, uh, if you do a computer search, you can, uh, what's known is that any number less than 10 to the 20 uh, is, is also the sum of three odd primes. So there's only finitely many cases left to check. Um, but unfortunately, the number of cases left to check is, is still uh, um, uh, many orders of magnitude larger than what we can actually do by computers. So uh, this conjecture still remains open. Um, although last, uh, last month, though, um, I was able Oh, I, I made a, uh, uh, I was able to prove a slightly, um, a slight variant of this conjecture. Um, so if you, if you instead of uh, talking about, if you, instead of using three primes, if you're allowed to use up to five primes, uh, then this actually turns out to be much easier to uh, to to uh, um, um, to work with this. And you can actually you can actually modify Vinogradov's argument, and you show that every every odd number, not just the large ones, uh, you can write as the sum of at, at most five primes. Um, so uh, six had, um, it was previously known that every even number can be written as using at most six primes. And so I could 
shave the six down to a five. So just uh, two more to go, and then it can get three. Um, all right. Um, another nice theorem is uh, Chen's theorem. So I told you about the, the, the twin prime conjecture that um, that that uh, the, we believe there's infinitely many primes p such that p plus two is also a prime. Uh, so that remains open, but we do have this nice partial result that um, called Chen's theorem that uh, we, you can find infinitely many primes p where p plus two is what's called almost a prime, an, an almost prime. It's either prime or the product of two primes. So it, it may have some factors, but not very many. Just, uh, so um, so you, this is the closest we can, we've gotten to the twin prime conjecture. Uh, there's actually a, a real, there's a, there's a very important reason why we can't get, go beyond this and actually prove the, the twin prime conjecture. It's something called the parity problem. But um, this is the best we can do. Um, it's a fairly sophisticated argument, but ultimately it's based on a very simple idea. It's um, uh, what's called sieve theory. Um, which is that one way to actually find the primes is to, um, is to, is to, is to um, start with all the numbers, all the integers here, and just start knocking out multiples of two, which are these red lines here, multiples of three, and multiples of five, which are these, these, these green lines and so forth. And pretty soon, uh, if, you, if you keep knocking out uh, multiples of small primes, all you have left um, will, be, uh, will, be, will be primes or maybe almost primes. Um, and, this, and so this is the starting point for, for, for this theory. Um, okay, uh, here's my theorem of Ben Green, um, which is uh, about uh, progressions in the primes. So we can't find twins in the primes yet, um, but it turns out that there are this, these other patterns, arithmetic progressions in the primes, that, that we can actually find uh, for a special reason, actually, um, which actually uh, uh, Professor Alon mentioned briefly in the, his talk. But um, the, um, yeah, so an arithmetic progression, of course, is, is, is an equally spaced uh, sequence of numbers, and so, uh, so these are sequences where where um, uh, where all the, uh, the the entries are prime. So five, eleven, seventeen, twenty-three is an arithmetic progression of primes of length four, um, and so you can keep finding um, progressions of primes, which are longer and longer. But but uh, the longer you want to make your progression, the harder it is to find these progressions, and they get bigger and bigger. So I've, I've listed here the first um, like. 5, 11, 17, 23, 29 is the first progression of primes of length 5. If you want progression of length 6, you've got to start at 7. And pretty soon, you, you, you get pretty big. The, um, the longest progression that people have actually found uh, explicitly is of length 26. Um, but we were able to show that, that, that this, this series does actually go on forever. That even though we, we can't actually write down explicitly where they are, we can I can tell you that, that there, are, there are progressions of primes of, of, uh, of any length whatsoever, uh, any finite length um, whatsoever. Um, so uh, the proof is, uh, I will have to go a separate hour to explain how, how that proof works. But the, um, the, um, um, the, the very rough idea is to take the primes and split them into two pieces. There's sort of a structured part which captures all the patterns that the primes have, such as being odd and being uh, co-prime to three and so forth. And you can sort of isolate all the structured part of the primes and, uh, and put that aside. And then what's left is sort of this random noise, or what's called pseudo-random noise. And you have this, this, this other part. And what, basically, the, roughly speaking, what you show is, is that both, um, you don't really know which, how much of the primes goes into the structured part and how much goes in, into the random part. But what, what you show is that both parts generate somehow lots of arithmetic progressions. And so no, no matter how the primes are distributed between structure and randomness, no matter what patterns do or do not exist in the primes, you can always find arithmetic progressions. And this is a special property of arithmetic progressions that um, uh, is not shared by most other, most other patterns. And so you, you could use that to, um, uh, to find patterns in the primes. Um, yeah, so um, you can use this method to, to solve several other problems, um, one, one of which is kind of cute. Um, involves a variant of the primes called the Gaussian primes. Um, so the, the primes are integers, they, they live on a line. Um, the Gaussian primes are complex, complex primes. So they're, they're complex um, integers, um, complex numbers of uh, integer real and imaginary parts that can't be divided, factored into two smaller complex numbers, complex integers. Um, so uh, here, this, this picture, by the way, this, this is a, um, a, a plot of, 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 of um, all the Gaussian primes, I think, uh, of magnitude less than 100. So it's, it's a nice little pattern here. And, um, and the analog of the theorem that primes contain arbitrary long progressions is, uh, um, is, is a statement that Gaussian primes contain arbitrary constellations. So um, I can refer back to, uh, to uh, uh, that picture of Russell Crowe uh, in uh, 
So that, that, that picture I showed earlier, that's from the film A Beautiful Mind uh, from a few years back. Um, and there's a scene in that movie where Russell Crowe, who's playing John Nash, um, is trying to impress his girlfriend. Um, and they're, they're, hmm? Because she's in here. Yes. Okay. So yeah. So he's uh, uh, yeah. They're, they're watching the night sky. He, he asks his girlfriend to, to pick a shape, and yeah, she picks uh, I think an umbrella, and uh, and he looks around, and then he he points out like six or seven stars that that, that makes an umbrella, and the girlfriend is impressed. Um, so um, so what I was able to prove was that you can always pull that off in the Gaussian primes if you want. That, um, <laughs> Okay, that's somewhere out, out here, there, there, there's an umbrella or an octopus or whatever you like. Um, in fact, there's infinitely many of them. Um, so that's, uh, um, okay, I'm kind of fond of that result, just because of the interpretation. Um, okay, but there's, there's lots of other things that we've been doing too. Um, yeah, so very uh, more recently with Ben Green and Tamar Ziegler, uh, we've been using tools from another area of mathematics called ergodic theory. Uh, which is sort of study of of of, uh, of, of orbits on 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 spaces. Like uh, if, if you if you like working on this little torus here, and if you if you start jumping around um, the torus in a certain way, like you, you take hops of a certain length, you will um, uh, um, as as long as your 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 hop is sort of sufficient, sufficiently ir irrational, you will start filling out the torus very evenly. Um, and this is so. There's, there's all these um, results about equidistribution, which you can actually. <laughs> used to count more patterns in the primes. Um, and uh, well, OK, so uh, uh, the, the precise thing we prove is, 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 is a bit hard to, uh, to, uh, to explain. But this is, a, this is one typical result that, that, that we were able to show using tools from ergodic theory, that um, if you want to count, say, how many um, uh, ethnic progressions of length four, say, there are in the primes. Um, so our previous theorem said that there are lots and lots of, 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 these, of these patterns, these progressions of length four. But um, our previous theorem didn't give a, a, an exact count as to exactly how many there are. But if you combine it with, with these, um, these tools from ergodic theory, you can actually get much more precise counts as to exactly how many uh, progressions there are in, in various ranges. So if you want to say how, how many uh, progressions of length four there are up, up, up to size, size n, it turns out to be basically it's roughly this number, n squared over log to the fourth n times a certain absolute constant. Just turns up like this, um, and you can you can start counting all these other things. So uh, we've been making more progress on, on on prime number theory, but there's still many 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 conjectures left to work on. Here's a couple that are just uh, um, just names here, but uh, yeah, it's, it's still a subject which which has uh, which is really, uh, many many difficult questions, and uh, so uh, we'll still be studying this stuff. We've been working on this for two thousand years. I think we'll still be working on prime number th on on on, on the subject for two thousand more. But anyway, thank you very much. It's, it's the product, it's an infinite product of various rational numbers, ah. one for each prime. Um, it's, yeah, it's what's called a singular series. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, I think it's, just a, it's just a number. Uh, it's, there's nothing terribly special about it. Yeah, it's, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. You, you talked about the, the structure and the pseudo random portions. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. how, how did you make that? Oh, is, that a, is that a well known? Uh, um, yes. It was well known. This, these sort of decompositions were well known in other fields. Um, so, uh, in, in ergodic theory, in particular, there was. Um, 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 if, if, you, if you take a dynamical system, if you take a, 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 some sort of thing like a torus, and you and you, and you have uh, some some dynamics on it, then, then people were were splitting, were classifying these, these dynamics into things like periodic dynamics and and and, and like ergodic dynamics. There were, there were these splittings into structured and random pieces. Um, so there was that, and also in graph theory, uh, there was uh, there was also a very um, uh, powerful um, decomposition of uh, something called the, the Zimmer regularity lemma, which takes any graph and sort of breaks it into structured things like like bipartite graphs or empty graphs, and plus sort of this um, and random graphs. And uh, what we Ben and I did was that we we took the the ideas from from the regularity lemma from graph theory and from 
some decomposition from a Goddard theory, and we were able to find an analog of that thing which was actually useful for number, for number theory. Yeah. How is this related to the Cantora? Is it related to Cantora, Kolmogorov, Arnold Moser? Um, uh, well, that's also a dynamical oh. system, uh, it's a, cont a continuous one. Um, it's, well, that's, that's also, well, that's another dynamical system, but uh, dynamical system is a very, very broad subject. Uh, I don't think there's any direct connection, other than that the both dynamics and tori are involved. Um, for, for the application of prime numbers, actually, we, we don't, I mean, we don't just work with tori. Uh, we also work with, with more complicated shapes. Um, See, as the time goes on, this, this, time, this can tori, they shrink, and you get a chaotic C. And that's what happens in the number, in the distribution of the numbers. You get a chaotic C, more and more improbable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, this is uh, this is what dynamical systems tend to do. They either they exhibit very periodic behavior or they exhibit sort of very chaotic behavior. So there's always this dichotomy between structure and randomness. So we, uh, I mean, but we don't directly use the mathematics of KEM theory. But I mean, there is sort of a similar spirit. I think. Yeah. Yes, David. So do these arithmetic regressions occur in some sense at random? What's the distribution of them? Uh, yeah, they they do occur at random, uh, except for some um, irregularities at small moduli. So, um, for example, if you want a progression of length three in the primes, um, the spacing must be even, uh, just because you have to have at least two of the numbers have to be odd. Um, so, um, and if you want a progression of length four, then I think the spacing must also be divisible by three, um, and so forth. So there's, there's, there's some uh, constraints uh, um, like that. But, um, and so there's some irregularities as to how they're just distributed mod two, mod three, and mod five. But, but other than that, uh, you, we can actually show that they're distributed um, more or less uniformly by, by using this, 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 uh, this theorem of uh, myself, of Ben, and Tammy. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, on 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 one level, okay. So, um, I mean, there's, there's sort of a trivial way in which the answer, the answer is yes. You can sort of cook up a dynamical system by taking a, 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 like a binary string, which is one at the primes and, and zero, and not the primes, and just sort of shifting it to the left. Okay, that's sort of a boring way to, to create this. Yeah. You you, what you want is a dynamical system which has nothing to do with the primes and which you can analyze by some other type of mathematics, but which has this correspondence. Um, so what you can do is that you can construct these, these probabilistic models of the primes, um, these, uh, what's called Kramer models, um, um, sort of random sets of, uh, like a, basically a random dynamical system which, which has the same statistics, which we can believe have the same statistics as the primes. Um, and that's something that you can study very explicitly and that gives you all kinds of conjectures. Um, it, like you can predict how many twin primes there are up to number n and so forth using these, these, uh, these probabilistic models which you can think of as dynamical systems. But what we don't have is a way to connect those probabilistic models with the actual primes themselves. I mean, we can conjecture that they give the same, but that we don't have the precise link. Yeah. Thanks. Right, yeah. So you mentioned that uh, every uh, odd integer is a sum of five primes? At most five primes, except for one. At most five. Yeah. Is this by subtracting two primes and, uh, and going below? Yeah. Okay. You, 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 yes. Yeah. So, the, yeah. So it's sort of a cheat. Uh, the, 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 um, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the way we, we prove that every odd number is a sum of five primes is that we already know that every number up to about ten to the uh, actually we use ten to the fourteen actually uh, uh, ten to the eighteen I think is the current record, but ten to the fourteen is enough for what I do. Um, that every number of us up to uh, every even number up to ten to the fourteen is a sum of two primes. So you just need to write to write a number a sum of five primes. You can write a sum of three primes plus an even number less than ten to the fourteen. Um, and that, that makes Vinogradov's method much easier. It, it, uh, uh, but yeah, yeah, that, that is the first trick. Yeah, you, you, you're on the ball. All right. All right. Um, 
Um, not not so many, I guess. Um, you can get a job in a math <laughs> I mean, it, it comes up. I mean, primes do come up very occasionally in in, in other parts of uh, in in other sciences. Um, so, um, for example, I, I think in, in biology, um, like certain crickets have like a seven-year cycle, and other crickets have like an eleven-year cycle. And it's important that these two cycles are co-primes, so that, 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 that these two species don't like collide with each other too often or something. Like they, they, um, primes do give certain equidistribution properties, which which have some minor uh, impact on 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 um, uh, on dynamics you know, in, in biology and so forth. But but yeah, to be honest, they, they're not they're not major. Uh, um, Applications. In fact, um, one um, it's been suggested that because primes so rarely appear in nature, that uh, that they'd be a good candidate for um, uh, for a signal to send out to to, to, to aliens to 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 to, to, to uh, as, as evidence of of, of of intelligence. That if if we ever hear a signal from space that is two, three, five, seven, eleven, we should pay attention. Yeah. <laughs> Values. Are, are, are basically the zeros of the zeta function, and because it's Hermitian, then you automatically get that all the zeros are on a line. And, um, but um, no, there's been no serious candidate for a natural operator of that form, and uh, I'm, not, not, actually, I'm not really sure that, that, that there really, there's any reason why there has to be one. Actually, um, yeah, uh, as you say, I mean, there, there is this connection that uh, yeah, energy levels of, of random operators. Have the same statistics as uh, uh, seem to have the same statistics as, as the zeros of the zeta function, but I don't think that's because the zeta function is is is, is coming from a, a a random operator of any sort. I think it's just because those statistics are actually are actually quite universal. That, that that many different processes generate the same statistics. For example, the, the, those same statistics have also been observed in in the stopping times of buses in in, in Mexico, um, and uh, there's, a very, there's a famous paper about that. Um, and um, you know, and again, the, 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 that has nothing to do with primes or with atomic nuclei or any of the other situations where where these, these statistics have come about. I think it's just there's a there's some it's, it's just a, it's one of these universal laws. It's, it's like the bell curve, the Gaussian. The Gaussian shows up in so many places, but which are which are unrelated. Um, and it's just because the Gaussian is itself so special mathematically. It's something that you just have to do. I think you go to graduate school. I mean, it, it is um, it is an important transition you have to make. That you, you, you spend you know half your you know you spend 16 years in, or so in school learning these, to pass these tests and to, to memorize these things. And and uh, once you go to graduate school and you actually have to have to have to have to, uh, have to actually produce your own research and, and, and think independently. Um, I mean, it, it it can be very uncomfortable to, uh, initially when you, to realize that there's no no, one, no one's giving you tests anymore. That you have to actually. Ask your own questions, and um, well, I, I mean, I mean, it's just, it's something that, that every graduate student just has to has to learn how to do. Um, I mean, but uh, I guess the one thing is, it's just to, I mean, as, as long as you're aware that 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 life is not an endless series of tests, and that you know, that, that uh, at, at some point, you know, you actually have to think for yourself. You know, I mean, that's a very important first step. Okay, last question. Mm -hmm. Does it give any more information other than the fact that uh, random numbers are randomly distributed? Uh, I'll explain because one of the students he mentioned that uh, uh, that n log n has something got to do with n factorial. So if we take n factorial, then you have n numbers which are not prime because you take n factorial plus one plus two up to n, generally not prime. Right. So when you go beyond that, then you'll get some delta neighborhood in which you will get actually a prime number. So is that uh, so that n right. log n uh, to basically just that just shows that the random numbers are, uh, sorry, the prime numbers are randomly distributed to some extent. So, so right. I mean, it, it tells you what the density of prime numbers are. So, um, you know, it, 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 it does give you lots of intervals which are sort of guaranteed to contain primes, but but it doesn't tell you precisely where in those intervals the primes are. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, uh, um, 
yeah, the, the, the primes do, uh, you know, if you take the logarithm of the factorials, yeah, they, they, they do, they'll give you a sequence which is, which are close to the primes, but, but are not actually the primes themselves. Um, yeah, so I mean, it, it, does, it does give you a lot of information, a lot of large scale information, but it doesn't give you the, the small scale information. And you, you, need, you need other tools to understand that. Can I get you a lecture on my uh, pen drive? Um,